am Olivia. I'm the curator of exhibitions here at Nottingham Contemporary. And I was one of the people that worked on this group show, Our Silver City 2094. The show was conceived um, by an artistic team and it was based on a methodology by a curator and graphic designer, Prem Krishnamurthy. The methodology really centers collaboration and group work. And so the artistic team was conceived and um, it included different artists, thinkers, writers, Celine Condorelli, Grace Doritu, Femme Kahara Graven, and the novelist and writer Liz Jensen. The show is also complemented uh, with a publication, a novella written by Liz, Liz Jensen. Um, and we're really seeing this exhibition as a novel, as exhibition, exhibition as novel. The Silver City has undergone decades of pandemics, wars, conflicts. Um, we see a real change. The show asks us to uh, travel in time and we explore lots of different works from painting, collage, moving image, sculpture, um, and uh, even some archival objects and objects from historical collections. These are a series of maps of Nottingham which are on loan to us um, from the School of Geography from the University of Nottingham. Um, and there are a series of maps that look at lots of different things from the geography, the structure of the city, um, but also the flooding areas, um, how people move through the city, their journey to work. For us, it really became an exercise in thinking about how people use maps to navigate, but also to map other things, other ecologies um, and other economies. And I think it's really a provocation to think about how we might use maps in the future. So this work is a work called Ciel by Nicola L, who uh, is a Moroccan artist who was based in New York in the US and um, was very much associated with the pop art movement. Um, Nicola L was working in textiles and using lots of plastics and fabrics in her works and created this series in the 60s and 70s that were these sort of skins, these kind of outfits, um, which originally would have been performed in or would have invited audiences to actually wear. Um, and seal is the French word for sky. And uh, Nicola L would have these words sort of stenciled across um, the pieces of fabric or the skins to sort of remind us about um, our bodies and our bodies' relationship to the environment in which we live. So this is a work by a Japanese conceptual artist, Onkawara, um, and the work is from a lifelong series of date paintings, um, where Onkawara would take a newspaper from the city he was in um, on a particular day, and would then paint the date as shown uh, on the newspaper. Um, he would then paint, spend all day painting this work, and um, at the end of the day, if he had not finished the painting, he would then destroy this work as it would not have been made on that day. Um, there are many dates um, in this series. I think there are about 3,000 works. Um, some of them of historical social significance. Um, others have more of a personal biographical significance for the artist. This work here um, is the day before the fall of the Berlin Wall, so of um, major historical significance and sort of acts as a time capsule um, of a certain moment in time. Um, I think I always imagine the artist sort of spending all day working on this work, um, really sitting with that date and remembering, sort of recognizing that passing of time. Hello, I'm Simon Withers and I'm a gallery assistant here at Nottingham Contemporary. I'm here to talk in our gallery too about some aspects of uh, various artists who are on show in this gallery. Uh, to set the kind of uh, tone of it is the installation is really kind of set up by Celine Condorelli. And um, although prior to this show, um, her background is very much in architecture as well as art, but she hadn't considered herself as an image maker. She's contributed to this by having three large printed works. And some of those explore the aspect of this gallery is about the nature of um, color being introduced within um, future thinking relating to this exhibition in 2094. I'm very much looking at just three artists at this, of which um, Delphine Rees is uh, this work here, Cartouches. Um, briefly, the cartouche is a noble form from the Egyptian period with an underline at the bottom. And what this would signify is uh, the idea of uh, the text enclosed within the cartouches of a real name. 
It was also used in hieroglyphs. And that was seen as what would be described as either a circuit or a ring representing eternal protection. The work has also been described as creating an accidental painting. And to that, um, in some ways, it's also been described as some form of animal and its connections to the nature of um, the animal world with uh, things like squids and octopus, cuttlefish and nautilus, who either change colour depending on um, light, uh, either as a form of protection or um, sometimes in the, in the form of octopus is, is what they would do is like uh, squirt black ink out into, um, to protect themselves or to hide themselves in a, in a cloud of black. Uh, and I also saw it as a term of, of almost like evacuation. So what this animal is doing is evacuating these kind of coloured liquids. Agnesa Current's work here, called Airite 7, shows a meteorite hovering majestically over a white plinth. And what it does is represent the artist in a way that she's interested in contemporary economics and also the digital life of the internet and things like Wikipedia. But ultimately, she explores the peripheries of the cause and effect of both of these upon our lives and even future thinking. And also to that, the embodying of the absurdities and the precariousness of a speculative value. With this, it was very much related to, um, uh, you could say, the kind of financial aspects. And to this, I, I thought I would add that I see this also, that is also referenced, I think, within the um, um, Liz Jensen's novella about the idea of the black swan and the black swan theory. Now, what this is, in as much that, um, as far as the Europeans are concerned, it was seen as an almost as absolute that black swans didn't exist. And it wasn't until about 1726 that when two were, were brought over from Australia, that in some ways what was considered as absolute truth now became a doubt and then became a reality that black swans existed. And black swan theory is basically the idea of an extremely rare event that has severe consequences. And it is something that is suggested could not be predicted beforehand. Although after the event and after the effect, many falsely claim it could have been predictable. And so this was very much related to the idea of how do you make the financial markets much more stable and less prone to fear factor. There's one aspect of this also that uh, we'd be like to kind of explore in some ways is its relationship to that idea of chaotic order and in part the work of uh, Mandelbrot, the uh, French-American mathematician, and the idea of self-similarity in nature and the uncontrolled element of life. And in some ways this object is a black swan and likewise there is possibly other elements within gallery too that echo that nature. Isa Genson's work, World Receiver, is a piece of concrete, a cenotaph, something impotent. It is potentially the missing part. It is made of concrete and it echoes within this exhibition is the fact that concrete is the second most used substance in the world after water. During production, it accounts for 8% of greenhouse gas and global emissions. Portland stone cement, a limestone of the Jurassic period of which we got various fossils also made of limestone, accounts for carbon dioxide, which is also a major greenhouse gas. One aspect of concrete is the idea of its end of life. Concrete damage can be occurred and attributed to trapped water, seawater, freezing and bacterial corrosion. It is possible with the idea of kind of lost knowledge is if we went back to Roman concrete is uh, a completely different kind of constituent and one I believe we are still looking to decipher exactly how it was made. Uh, whereas they used volcanic ash, Roman concrete could be set and cast and hardened underwater and as it gets older it's meant to get harder and harder. And it's interesting in as much that we're potentially 
projecting the idea of a drowned world in less than 100 years' time, of which the very fabric of our concrete, which it is predicted, we will increase the amount of concrete that we'll be using and constructing in the future, may well be lost to us as a source of solidity. So in some ways, that in, as, a, as, a, as a material, one could say that, again, it's, it, it's becoming an illusion. It's already lost. And maybe this world receiver echoes that. Um, I'm Karen Lunt, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about this, um, this piece of work by Revital Cohen and Torban Balen. Before that, though, I just want to talk a little bit about artists and their materials. Um, before the middle of the 19th century, when you were apprenticed as an artist, as a painter, um, part of what you learnt was um, the making of paints, pigments and colours. And the um, part of your desirability of an art, as an artist was um, made up of your ability to make the best pigments, the best colours, uh, and colours that lasted over time. Um, then in the middle of the 19th century, uh, an American artist invented um, paint that could be uh, paint in a tube that you could take out with you. Um, before too long, this was mass produced, and by um, the second half of the 19th century, um, little tubes of paint were available to buy um, by anybody, really. And um, because um, of this kind of development, for the first time, artists were able to leave their studios um, and go out with their portable easels and sit in a field or wherever to look at a landscape and paint it from life. Um, without this development, you'd have um, never had um, Monet and his water lilies. You wouldn't have been able, he wouldn't have been able to paint the um, movement of light across water. And the whole, you can argue that the whole of modern art and, and what became contemporary art is predicated on this small technological innovation um, uh, because without portable tubes of paint you wouldn't have got any um, uh, 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 expressionism or anything that came after it. Um, which takes us to um, this picture. Now, in this gallery, we're looking at um, an art world that's um, gone through apocalyptic times um, where there have been a number of natural disasters, and we can, pre we can presume that nobody's still operating paint factories. Um, and so artists are once again uh, dependent upon their own ingenuity and initiative to create their own pigments. Uh, this work, um, the Blue Roan is part of a set of eight um, that the artists produced um, for an installation. And it's made of um, animal, uh, horse um, ashes from bones um, stuck onto a stainless steel background. Um, and they're colored to reflect the coloring of a Blue Roan horse. Um, Looking at that picture, when I first looked at it, um, I felt quite ambivalent about um, whether that was an ethical thing to do, to use the, um, the remains of a dead horse um, to make um, a decorative item. I was perhaps particularly um, affected by the fact that my daughter owns a Blue Roan pony horse and has done for the past 12 years or so and I'm very fond of him and I know him very well and I questioned whether it would be a suitable end to him to end up as a decorative piece on someone's living room wall um, and then I thought some more and I researched a little bit into the artists and I found that they've got um, a, a long history of questioning um, gambling, gambling industries which use the bodies of um, dogs and horses in particular um, for entertainment and, and for, um, for profit. Um, and looking at the grey, uh, well looking at the gambling industry, 
Um, for most horses who can happily live for over 30 years, their racing lives are over in about four years. Um, and the same for dogs who, who typically live about 15 years. And so every year, tens of thousands of these animals are made redundant by the industry that's um, produced them and maintained them. A few of the lucky ones might end up going out to stud um, and a few might be um, bought chiefly by teenage girls or become pets um, by, uh, you know, rehoused by greyhound trusts and so on. But most of them are um, killed. Um, and this is the sort of, this is what the artists are trying to um, yeah, communicate, have a debate about, tell us about. I also thought about bone china um, and um, the fact that that's, you know, let's get the clues in the name, it's made of bones and it's been made for centuries um, using the remains of bones and horses are used um, to produce gelatin um, and glue and various other things. Um, so there we are, that's what I wanted to say about that, make your own mind up. So here we're in gallery three um, of the exhibition and this is an installation designed by artist Grace Doritu. It's titled The Temple and it includes works by many other artists. The Temple is a structure that Grace works with a studio called Setworks and the structure is influenced by different references from Buckminster Fuller's 1950s housing project to sweat lodge structures uh, built by indigenous communities. Something that Grace was really thinking about when conceiving of this gallery was what would galleries look like in the future? What would be the purpose of museums? Would they be spaces for conversation, for exchange, a moment to be calm in, um, to sit amongst art and experience it in a different way? We see an, a range of works um, in here by lots of different artists, mostly reflecting on the idea of the handmade. So you'll see works that are textiles, you'll see collage that's been made by hand, sculpture and objects, as well as some historical artefacts and archival material. In Gallery 4, I'm going to be referring to uh, what is a Roman curse tablet uh, that um, these, uh, these objects are written to recover stolen objects, and it was useful frequently to dedicate the faith to a god in order to recover the objects. The translation of this one has proven to be kind of quite difficult on the material that I've um, located, um, but basically what it says is, I make a note of two gaiters, an axe, a knife, a pair of gloves, whether a low man or a privileged one, two parts to the God and him. It trails off, but what has been suggested that it could conclude with, and him burn in hell. This is where it gets quite interesting, in as much that this tablet is written basically in Latin, but with two Britonic words. There are misspellings, there are abbreviations, and there are oversights. And if this had been Latinized, it may well say something like, the cursed persons shall not be able to speak or eat any longer. The tablet was discovered at Red Hill, Radcliffe on Saw in Nottingham. And it was found amongst with three other ones in about 1963. In 1990, it was believed that and confirmed that it was the site of a Roman temple and the God that this was dedicated to was the God Jupiter which in Greek is Zeus. And in Roman, Jupiter is referred to as the Sky Father. And I think that ties in very nicely with the work that we've got in Gallery 4.